Hello, everyone. I am Rahul Gosain. And I'm Rohit Gosain. And we are the Oncology Brothers. GU Oncology has been a very hot space recently. Just four weeks, even before GU ASCO 2024, we had, three, we had seen three new approvals here. Balsutifan in RCC and Fortumab for bladder cancer and a confirmatory approval for erdafitinib in FGFR mutation bladder cancer. Then close to 500 abstracts were presented a few days ago at the 20th annual GU ASCO meeting. There was a lot of data presented, but today we'll focus on four critical studies. And to go over these studies, we'd like to welcome Dr. Tian Zhang from UT Southwestern. In our discussion, we'll start off with contact O2 and then breakaway in prostate cancer. We'll also discuss ambassador trial in bladder cancer and close off with keynote 564 adjuvant study in renal cell cancer. Tian, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Hi, Rahul and Rohit. Um, such a pleasure. I'm very happy to be here today. Well, Tian, welcome. Diving into right in our first study here, which is in metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer space. Now, we know that there has been slew of approvals last year, mainly for PARP inhibitors, uh, frontline if patients have BRCA mutation or HRR mutation. And if not, then we also know we have ADT with novel uh, th hormonal therapy, chemotherapy. Now, this trial is particularly in that space where we're looking at cabozatinib and atizolizumab, where after disease progression on one of the novel hormonal therapies. Tian, your thoughts on study design and its findings, please. Sure. Well, we had the um, initial trial called COSMIC-021, which was a basket study of cabozantinib and atezolizumab, um, uh, and it showed nice responses in patients with measurable disease um, uh, for, for the patients treated with this combination, and that's um, what led to the development of this confirmatory phase three. Um, so it is a, um, a, a I think well-designed um, randomized phase three option um, with cabozantinib and atezolizumab compared to secondary non-hormonal therapies. Um, there was a lot of discussion about this control cohort, uh, but switching non-hormonal therapies is a practice that we see uh, for castration-resistant prostate cancer. And um, at the time of the development, um, that was what was agreed upon with the FDA um, for um, what, what this study would mean. And the primary endpoint uh, was really around this progression-free survival, particularly in this cohort. Um, you know, these patients have visceral or measurable lymph node metastases, and so um, these patients are um, a valuable. Uh, so they're they're not the bone-only metastases, although there is a group um, of bone metastases. Um, but um, these patients are valuable by resist criteria, and importantly, uh, we did see, um, as you're showing here, um, a progression-free survival benefit. Yeah, thank you for going over that. But just a few things here. We know that CABO did not show overall survival in Comet series. Immunotherapy has also not been a success story in prostate cancer so far either. For me, it's as a community oncologist, it's tough to wrap my head around that two inactive agents are now showing some sort of synergy. And you've mentioned this as our control arm. Ideally, we would have liked to see docetaxel Plavictal lutetium PSMA at that time was not available, but we would have liked to see docetaxel because today, if this is not approved, docetaxel is what I'm going to rely on. So maybe there is a small patient population with perhaps liver disease where this could be more active. But if this gets approved, I am still not sure how much benefit this strategy will add or where I'm going to sequence this. Sure. Uh, you know, it. we can kind of throw a lot of beans at uh, a completed trial and, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. And, you know, if we had designed this trial today, would, would it have different uh, control cohorts? Um, maybe so. But um, I think it was a, a, a well done trial and was carried out. And um, and we should be able to um, think about what what population, right, um, we might apply this to in our practice. And 
You know, we have patients now who are post chemo and post lutetium um, who they are needing alternative strategies. Um, and um, uh, I, I firmly believe that if we uh, sequence um, strategies of treatment with um, progression free survival benefit, that that for that particular patient um, will evolve into um, getting them to live longer um, as an overall survival benefit, even if we are not seeing that right at this particular data lock um, for an overall survival benefit. And, you know, um, for Contact02, the events just are not mature yet. Um, we're still awaiting um, those results for overall survival. And, um, you know, uh, for me in my practice, and I'm, I see a lot of refractory disease, you know, um, any new therapy for our patients is, is good. Um, so if it come, uh, comes to an approval, um, then, uh, you know, obviously right now it's off label, but if it comes to an approval, I think whatever strategies we have to sequence therapies for our patients who are ultimately living, um, hopefully several years, many years, um, with metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer, um, it might be nice to have a different option. Absolutely. And that's the key in these metastatic settings. Are patients living longer or living better from our interventions? So sticking with the prostate cancer theme, no, uh, novel hormonal therapies in combination with PARP inhibitors are approved as Rohit had initially mentioned for our BRCA positive patients. This takes us to this study, Breakaway. Tian, your thoughts here on this phase two study? Sure. The Mecca Away is a uh, investigator-led effort um, from Maha Hussein and uh, many of our um, good colleagues around the country. Um, so it's a really well-designed study um, to um, interrogate uh, the combination of olaparib with abiraterone against each of the components. So we we talk about this a lot in um, previously with uh, Propel and magnitude of um, how much is that combination really adding. And so this trial is probably the best argument I've seen um, to think about combination approaches early. Um, as we saw um, the ARM cohort three here, which was treated with both olaparib and abiraterone, had an improvement in uh, progression-free survival compared to each of the monotherapy cohorts. Um, so that, to me, is meaningful. Um, and even though small populations, I think um, this is why we would uh, pick a combination over each monotherapy alone. Certainly, and that's exactly what has shown in the second line as well when you talk, or rather first line, uh, when you talk about telozoparib and enzalutamide. So it, it is impressive to see more data come along to firm our uh, already known finding here. Right. And, you know, um, I, I'm really interested in thinking about overall survival, to your point on the uh, prior trial, uh, because the question will be, um, will this also result in an overall survival benefit Indeed. for the combination compared to each, you know, sequential monotherapy? Um, and, you know, I, I haven't seen that data yet, but, um, you know, this 39 months versus 14 versus 8.4 is um, pretty, I think, clear clinically significant um, mm -hmm. uh, for, for the combination. Tian, so if someone has progressed on, let's say, abiraterone in first-line settings in castration-sensitive, but now the disease has progressed, are you going to use single-agent, let's say, olaparib, or would you use what Rohit was saying, talozaparib with Enza as a combination? Sure. Um, I, you know, I do see some um, cross resistance, um, and if uh, they're they're truly BRCA two, BRCA one, um, I think there's an argument to be made um, for either the monotherapy or the combination. Um, and I, I think. Um, actually, telozoparib label has the probably the broadest label for the genetic alterations. Um, and if um, there was a, a decent benefit on their frontline abiraterone. So say they're progressing now, you know, two years after their um, initial treatments, I might continue sort of that combination AR strategy and add in the talazoparib. Um, or um, if we're kind of concerned about toxicity, they didn't have a long benefit on their initial uh, abiraterone, um, we might think about um, switching completely to a laparib. Um, you know, interestingly, I have have seen um, some really 
really tremendous responses uh, to elaborate monotherapy. Um, so I, I don't think we should discount, um, but um, it's also nice to have combination options. Absolutely. And another thing to reemphasize here is testing or prostate cancer patients for germline mutations and somatic mutations is vital as we have a solid case to consider these combinations up front. Okay, switching gears to adjuvant treatment with Pembro, starting off with ambassador trial in high risk muscle invasive urothelial cancer post surgery. Nivolumab already is approved here based on DFS. Tian, your thoughts here? Sure. Oh, I, I participated um, in the Alliance uh, Cooperative Group on this ambassador study. Um, so um, we certainly saw um, patients who were treated. Um, and so this is a um, all investigator led um, effort uh, done through the NCI Cooperative Groups. Um, and patients were um, post um, uh, surgery, as you say, um, they may have had neoadjuvant chemo or not. And um, the higher risk disease features, as you see there, um, randomized to pembrolizumab for a year or observation. There was no placebo cohort, so patients knew um, if they were getting uh, pembrolizumab or not. Um, and uh, the disease-free survival and overall survival were the dual um, primary endpoints of the study. Um, and as you see, um, the disease-free survival um, at least was improved significantly, has a ratio of 0 0.69, which was statistically significant. I thought my friend Andrea Apollo did an, a tremendous job um, presenting this data and showing the world um, what benefit pembrolizumab has in the adjuvant setting. Um, there aren't enough um, survival um, events quite yet. Um, I'm told about 20% um, uh, of the survival events um, that were needed um, have actually happened. So um, we are not seeing um, the, the overall survival curve split out just yet, um, but more follow-up um, for sure um, will help us understand if that disease-free survival benefit benefit will translate into overall survival benefit. Absolutely. It's going to be exciting to uh, hold the nerves until the overall survival, full overall survival data comes out. Now, for another showstopper, adjuvant pembrolizumab in RCC space with overall survival data, where this was, again, an adjuvant setting itself, where study was Keynotes uh, 564, where patients with intermediate and high-risk disease post-nephrectomy received adjuvant uh, pembrolizumab versus placebo, and we've had approval for pembrolizumab based on DFS so far in 2021. And this study here was overall survival update. Tian, your thoughts on the overall survival here? Sure. Well, we've already had pembrolizumab approved in the adjuvant setting for high-risk renal cell carcinoma, and uh, I think everybody was waiting um, for the overall survival update. And um, you know, um, tremendously, I think um, we we do see an overall survival uh, benefit in this uh, intention to treat population. Um, uh, the hazard ratio was 0.62, and this was statistically significant, as was um, initially planned. Um, and just as a caveat, um, I. I was an investigator and on the steering committee for this trial. Um, so it's certainly um, uh, a trial that I think my pen patients um, had benefited from. And um, and we do have that conversation. Um, I think it's very much a patient-driven approach. Both of these adjuvant strategies is a, a patient um, shared decision-making moment um, where the patient um, should think about the data with their, their oncologist and decide if the, um, the improvement is meaningful meaningful for them. Um, as you um, uh, will remember at GUASCO, there were um, some pointed questions about um, the survival benefit. And I think any survival benefit for adjuvant trials and, and even in metastatic trials um, is colored a bit by uh, patients who receive subsequent therapy. And so um, there's been some discussion about you know, whether the patients in the control cohort have had access um, to uh, PD-1 therapies, immunotherapy therapies and um, in uh, after they progress or have metastatic disease. And so um, that's still, I think, to be determined. There was some data shown about um, post-subsequent um, therapies um, in uh, between cohorts, um, but I think depending on, it, it doesn't translate at, at 
patient level um, into um, who had the events and who did not. So um, it's a, it's still a, um, a a discussion to be had, but um, overall the overall survival benefit um, is the first one that we've seen in any adjuvant trial in kidney cancer, and I think that's um, a, a moment to be applauded. Absolutely. Tian, first off, congratulations on Ambassador and Kino 564 as you were part of both of these studies. Tian, any thoughts on why Nevo did not show benefit here, but Pemro did? Uh, I think for that, so we also saw Checkmate 914 data, um, as you are alluding to, um, in the adjuvant space for kidney cancer. Um, this That was a three-cohort trial we had seen previously, ipilimumab and ivolumab uh, presented against placebo. And now um, this GUASCO, we saw the nivolumab cohort compared against um, placebo. Um, and so I think when you're, um, first, it's hard to compare across um, trials, but um, we all do. Um, and uh, the nivolumab uh, trial, Checkmate 914, was um, one treatment with only six months um, instead of a year. Um, so that's a key difference. And then the other difference, I think if you look at the study populations, 914 did not include the M1 NED patient population and their uh, levels of T4 and 0 or any T um, node positive patients. Um, that category of the highest risk population um, was quite low. It was um, around seven percent, if I remember correctly. Um, and so um, those baseline patient characteristics can really drive population differences when we're looking um, across trials. Um, so those are my two hypotheses about why um, you know, the Checkmate 914 um, ended up uh, to be not um, so positive, while Keno 564 um, uh, has shown us disease-free survival and now overall survival benefit. It's interesting how in GU space, these uh, different immunotherapies tend to respond differently, while in lung space, we tend to see some uh, sort of uniformity there. Well, for now, we'll cherish the results of Keynote 564, given the overall survival. This is fantastic news for all our RCC patients. Tian, thank you so much for going over these critical studies from GU ASCO 2024 with us today. To those who are listening, stay with us for a short summary. In this discussion, we have covered four important studies from GU ASCO 2024 with Dr. Tian Zhang. First, Contact O2 looking at cabozantinib and atezolizumab role in metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. Then, we have also discussed the role of PARP inhibitors in prostate cancer based on BRCA8 trial, which continues to look very promising. We also had a chance to focus on adjuvant treatment in bladder cancer with pembrolizumab showing DFS benefit based off ambassador trial. And now we also finally have overall survival benefit in RCC with the use of pembrolizumab for intermediate or high-risk cancer patients in adjuvant settings. Thank you so much for joining us. Stay tuned for more conference highlights and practice changing data with us, the Oncology Brothers.